And uh, Olga, since you, we're talking about your tech background, I wanted to start with you and we'll jump right into our first question. And that is, what aspects of Russian do you think are the most challenging to teach online? Okay, so in general, teaching Russian is challenging, can be challenging, whether it's in person or whether it's online. But I did uh, note a couple things that I personally find challenging in an online environment. It's, of course, it's uh, trying to uh, keep students' attention, right? So trying to keep students' attention, especially if the class is long, if you're teaching online for like, like our startup classes, for example, an hour and a half. So uh, what I've noticed that if it is the materials are not motivating are not exciting, if they are not related to real, uh, like to be culture, <laughs> to real uh, Russian language uh, content, it's uh, more difficult to, to keep students motivated. As, as for the specific topics, I would say that probably moving students from input to output, this is challenging, especially because you have I would, I would say less control of the classroom, especially if it's virtual, if it's online or if you're doing asynchronous, a lot of asynchronous uh, tasks. So that's what we do in our uh, elementary, intermediate um, classes at speed. And uh, also probably writing. Writing and uh, handwriting it, it has been challenging. And I know that some of my colleagues uh, uh, in some programs have already uh, chosen not not to teach handwriting because nowadays a lot of students are using mostly computers and uh, phones to to type to to text. While I'm still kind of a little bit old school, so I believe that handwriting is is uh, helpful, especially in Russian speaking cul uh, cultures, because when students go abroad, they still end up filling out forms and you know, writing some notes or letters, explanations. So um, that's kind of challenging. So trying to find the ways how to for students to practice handwriting, how to correct it, right? So you just, I just needed to use special tools to make it work. So I would say these are my points. It's interesting that you bring up handwriting because I hear that from a lot of language teachers that that can be a big challenge, especially in the online environment. Thank you for that. And then let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, Larissa, if that's okay. Let's go ahead and ask the same question. What aspects of Russian do you think are the most challenging to teach online? Uh, yes, I will agree that uh, the input, uh, it's uh, easier for us to, to do online. Um, output, uh, harder. Uh, not impossible, and uh, the most difficult, I would say, aspect is uh, interpersonal communication. Um, interpersonal communication. So the communication not between the teacher and students, but actually between students to students. Um, there are different tools, but if it depends on uh, of your audience, right? I work mostly with um, school age children right and high schoolers too um so it needs to be some protocol of accountability for for that too uh so that's i found uh, more challenging to plan again not impossible but challenging to plan um with younger children uh we should always use the total physical response which is kind of harder online as well um, but again, not impossible, just have to plan for that. Um, and like the body response too. So it's it's harder to uh, to see online when you have like a talking talking head. Um, but there's some different strategies that we can use with that with younger children. Um, and also we, we know that the language is happening um, through using it. So aiming to this increasing the um, output of students, they're speaking especially. I would say there's a many tools for the writing nowadays. Um, as speaking is the one that takes more uh, preparation. Uh, for writing, I use different programs for um, like interpersonal writing. For example, I use uh, the platform uh, called Formative. Uh, so Formative, um, there is a free version of it. There is some, you know, more uh, advanced there, um, like silver version, a gold version. But um, everybody can use a free version for 
uh, instruction. So during the instruction, um, students can reply right away um, and have this accountability uh, of this output, uh, like in a real time. For example, you can show the picture and then you see uh, what they're writing. Uh, it can be done anonymously. So if uh, I'm projecting it to the screen, um, I don't want like students to be embarrassed of like their different, um, you know, spelling mistakes or something. Um, but I do know, like from my point of view, I know who is writing what. So this kind of the level of accountability. With this speaking is is harder, like I said. Um, and with this speaking, um, all this, you know, in a classroom, not in an online classroom, we use a turn and talk. Um, you cannot use it as uh, frequently as you can use it um, in a person. Um, however, uh, there are such a function in Zooms as uh, rooms. Again, it's a paid subscription, right? You Or, or if you're working through the university uh, or some organization, you, you should be covered for this. But um, personally, you, you do have to. Uh, pay for that um, for the Zoom function as rooms. Um, again, you cannot do it every 10 minutes, um, but at least you know a couple of times during the class or so one or two times you can do that, uh, allow students to go to rooms to discuss and to talk about uh, the uh, subject to, to use the sentences that they have to practice. Um, accountability piece here, uh, I found that uh, there is a function that you can go through these rooms and um, listen what students are talking about. You can even through the Zoom see if they are talking. So if you see there's nothing like um, no uh, sound bar means they're just silent. Um, and I would say that would be a struggle too. So I have to constantly like poke uh, and just go, okay, we have to actually talk. We're using the sentence frames. Um, let's discuss that. Um, what I found, another thing that can work with the um, higher proficiency, not with the novice, uh, maybe as novice need and like, the students who could already write the responses, is another accountability when they have to fill something out during their discussion. Um, but again, it's uh, a lot of planning, um, but I think it's worth it. Uh, I see the results of that, and also students are, have to practice and use their language right away from the first from the first lessons. Um, I would say um, other things since we're talking about different uh, different uh, materials that we can adapt. Um, I also use uh, easy things like uh, you know um, Google Docs, for example. Um, even without, you know, subscription to formative, you can use Google Docs and just create some documents together. Um, so students are talking and then they produce something. So they have this evidence that they talk about this and come up with, uh, um, with a written response after discussion. Um, another thing could be used is the uh, word wall. Uh, word wall when um, students are looking at things and they have to uh, listen and to discuss that too. Um, did I mention all of this? So there's some other tools. So just the bottom line is that um, I think the most difficult is to create this kind of environment for interpersonal communication. Uh, with the written tools, there are some tools uh, but this interpersonal communication is very hard to um, uh, start this routine. The routine really helps too. Um, I I see that the students who are older, not the high school students, um, they probably understand that um, the the meaning of this you know conversational practice. But with children, um, they're more. Um, maybe shyness and they're afraid to make a mistake uh, and then they don't see the teachers with them in a room and very most of the time it starts with just silence right so they have to um, make sure they understand the meaning of it um, kind of set up set them up for success um, 
And another thing that I would say too is it's hard to in the online environment to create kind of the I call it the word wall or the talking wall that you can uh, point uh, to see like okay here's a progression of skills. Um, I, I use the some boards in a, in a Zoom. You can actually use the a board, uh, interactive boards, and just keep like adding information on during each class. And so this is like kind of we can create it together during the lessons. Um, so there are many, many tools, but it doesn't mean it's easy to um, to do. Uh, when I taught a very big class, uh, then I used another program, kind of very, it's difficult to set up, but um, I forgot what's the name of it. Mm. Oh, the Gather Town. I think with a, with the Start Talk people, we use that too. So um, this is when you can actually uh, choose your partner to talk. Uh, so it takes a lot of setting up. But once you set it up, then it's easier to um, have this kind of gamification of a conversation when you have to talk to different people and you don't have to be assigned by a teacher to special room like you have to uh, use some um, sentences to ask and answer questions even on a novice level right you can ask like uh, and so on so it just makes it more more fun for especially um, younger kids and teenagers too as well to have this um, kind of interactive conversations but it can also use with a, a advanced proficiency as well. Um, you know, all this in a classroom, we can have inside and outside circles when sp people are speaking, but it could be um, done in this program when you have uh, two circles of people talking to each other. One might have a text and another might have the picture and you have to uh, find this uh, match. So you have to talk to all the people um, use particular phrases, sentence frames, and um, finding your pair. So it takes um, a lot of talking to different people and movement online. Um, I think that's what's like the main thing that I wanted to mention here. Um, if anybody wants to say anything more about this, I'm, uh, I'm ready for conversation. Thank you, Larissa. And yes, the interpersonal aspect of online communication can be quite challenging, especially if you have some reluctant learners that are a little shy. But I appreciate you sharing those tools and resources with us. Thank you for that. Uh, Shannon, asking you the same question. And once again, our question is, what aspects of Russian do you think are the most challenging to teach in an online environment? The thing that came to my mind, and I guess it's not unique to Russian, is that I think it's um, one of the most difficult things is creating a community in the classroom. And it's related to what uh, my colleagues were talking about before uh, with the difficulty of kind of informal communication. Uh, you know, it, in face-to-face -face classrooms, we're used to just having chit-chat before class or after class or sort of chit chat to the side um, that allows students to get to know each other and us to get to know them. And so I think that creating that community is something we have to, when we're teaching online, we have to be a little more um, deliberate about it, a little more intentional about trying to create that community. And so there are some different things that we can do. I think I'm just gonna pick one to focus on right now. Um, and maybe our colleagues have other, suggestions that they can put in the chat. But um, I think we often, we already do this in our classrooms, but I think uh, in an online classroom, we have to make even more of an effort to have our activities uh, built in so that they will need to listen, talk to each other, but also listen to each other. Um, so uh, when they report back, for example, if you have them go into breakout rooms and do something, Oftentimes we have them report back after that uh, to the whole group. And um, it may be easiest to have them report back about themselves, but then that means that they may not be getting to know their 
uh, fellow classmates as well. And so I think making even more of an effort and being more intentional about having them always get to know each other uh, and have to maybe report back on their partner rather than themselves um, is a small thing that we can do, I think, to help to foster that community. I love the idea of asking students to report back things that they learned about their partner and getting some extra time in there to really share some thoughts and ideas. So thank you for that, Shannon. And definitely building a community is a really important part of teaching online. And that can definitely be challenging to do in the online environment. Thank you. And Evgeny, again, the same question, what aspects of Russian do you find that are most challenging to teach online? Uh, thank you. I think phonetics, and intonation is very challenging, something that requires immediate feedback and individual feedback, something we are able to give in, you know, in real time. Um, I mean, face to face, uh, that's something that I've struggled a lot. Uh, I, and I think we should do more phonetics work, period, um, regardless of the modality we're teaching, but uh, certainly do not lose this out of sight just because it's hard uh, harder, uh, we still need to, um, you know, make sure this IK3 is uh, is there and the sounds are there. So we, I ended up ended up asking students to repeat what I said or work on the phonetics with the uh, turn of mics. This is um, uh, I, I don't have time to ask in, in, individual students to to say a word a uh, word or a sentence, but so they'll have to do it. Um, on, on their own kind of thing uh, without me necessarily hearing them. And that kind of brings me uh, to the point we are all making, and especially Larissa, you're making about the control, accountability. And I think online environment is, is, is when we actually rethink our, uh, you know, understanding of control and how much we can or should control um, our students. Yes, making them accountable, having them write something or say something, but uh, inevitably we it it's a much it's it's much less control environment if we want to make it effective. We lose something, we gain something. Breakout rooms and work with a partner in breakout rooms is by far the most meaningful and important part of uh, online lesson uh, lessons uh, according to my students. So they all say this was the most interesting, fun, uh, again, meaningful part of the class. So I would challenge myself to do more than, you know, a couple of times uh, per class. I think, you know, going into breakout rooms can be clunky and can be going out of the um, uh, breakout, break, breakout rooms can be sort of a time consuming but I think what we gain with this is so so precious so we I think we have to do it and um when I actually go to to breakout rooms my students know that I will not I will not say oh здравствуйте как дела so they will just continue working uh on the activities so I'll just be the fly on the wall uh, so we, you know, the class develops this routine understanding that, okay, we go to breakout, breakout rooms, we go straight to work, and uh, we do that uh, interpersonal communication. And it's funny, some of us mentioned the um, uh, how community is, is difficult to form, and that's true. At the same time, shy students often report it's, it's easier for them to talk uh, online when you know fewer people are hearing them in their breakout rooms uh it's it's not like the whole class is watching and listening them so that's we got this opposite effect in a way and I find it uh, make it much easier to switch partners in my classroom I just it's hard for me to <laughs> constantly switch partners and pairs. I know it's good for students, but you know, they get in this these they comfortable, you know, seats and they work with the same partners. So uh, online allows us to constantly switch partners and develop the habit that okay, there will be a new partner with each activity. And I think that's great. I just also want to I want a second formative. I think formative is an excellent, excellent tool. I use it for quiz 
quizzes and um, I can see the results of the quizzes, like vocabulary quizzes that students do online. Um, and that's just, uh, there's a special color coding system when I can see red and green and it's so convenient and I can see items for example I got 10 items and one item one word you know 80 percent students got wrong and I see red and like okay this is something I can work on right now right here and that's very very convenient so I think I find formative a very useful tool um, but at the same time, I'm thinking, how can we use less technology in online classrooms? So what I experienced, and I don't know, my colleagues, what, what you think, um, and audience, um, please, um, say what you think. So if, if it's, if it's tool after tool after tool, there's so many great tools available, but then it, at the end of the day, it becomes just, Okay, so we need to log in, we need to make sure everyone is in the system, everybody's there, everybody knows how to use it. And it um I'm I'm constantly um telling myself to limit the use of online tools. There are certain ones that are essential, like Google Docs that was mentioned. Yes, but um all others, you know, Kahoot, Formative, another Word Wall, they're all great, but um um, I need to remind myself that, you know, um, everything is in moderation and it could be fatigue and um, certain sort of a um, time, loss of time uh, as we switch from, from tool to tool. And finally, I just want to uh, go back to the question of handwriting. I, I agree that handwriting is important, but, and sometimes our students all all five you know the whole five students who will end up going to russia or a russian-speaking country they will end up filling out some form but you know those forms need to be completed in block letters oftentimes anyway and um i don't i don't know if we need to really um push this and insist on uh teaching them to handwrite it's it's a very useful tool but Again, we we get typing much, much faster. Remember, uh, you know, six years ago, seven years ago, it was second year when I introduced typing or required typing in my classroom. Now our students can and encourage to type and have to type so much faster. And typing is the new handwriting. <laughs> uh, we type all the time so i think it's, it's it's it is an essential skill much I, I would argue that it's you know on the priority scale you know hand, typing is number one handwriting is number two uh even with all the benefits of uh uh cognitive you know remem remembering words super useful but it's okay if students uh do it in block letters that's 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 fine i think uh because what they gain is ability to type in Russian much faster. Thank you for sharing those thoughts with us, Evgeny, and actually just kind of thinking back to what you said a moment ago about you know, too much technology. I think I'm seeing quite a bit of that. And it's definitely a balance. We want to make sure that we're engaging students and even related to handwriting, we want to make sure that we are showing them, okay, this is how to type. But also at the same time, we don't always want to go too deep into the technology. We don't want to spend so much time getting the students onboarded into the latest and greatest fad technology. And then well, we might have lost 20 minutes of time that they could be doing in a breakout room, actually conversing with each other, getting that interpersonal time in. So it's definitely a balance. There is definitely a lot to say on that topic. And we really appreciate all of the input. Oh, Larissa, please chime in. Yes, I just wanted to uh, mention about formative and other function that I use, not uh, always for the online um, class, but for the homework too. So I like this, the homework too that I can assign. I can assign actually um, reading, uh, listening, or watching videos with questions as a homework, um, and students can reply um, as a, in a written form. Or there's many, many different opportunities to show uh, their um, work done. They can even draw a picture for, you know, different proficiencies. They can actually uh, record audio, uh, like the audio, and I can, uh, in, on a scale, then provide a feedback 
on how well they talk on the topic. So I like this uh, variety and I also like that it could be like a self check too. So um, if I set up the program uh, informative for, for the homework, right? For the homework, uh, they can actually see uh, if they're correct or not correct. You know, some things you still have to read and provide the feedback uh one case by another but uh you know some things they can see oh i'm not right so i have to look something else um another thing that formative uh, has and really saves a lot of time for me is that you can actually uh put the standards for like actual standards there um and uh, students also see that they're working on a standard for you know for speaking for example um they're all very reluctant to speak by the way <laughs> <laughs> uh, and provide the audio uh, recordings, but uh, with kind of a uh, persuasion that you have to, as part of the language, you have to actually provide, uh, you know, not just one word response, but, um, you know, uh, sentences like a talking paragraphs to get, you know, the better scores on your test. Sometimes you have to even say that a test too, what, which works for the high schoolers. They want to get this, um, you know, the motivation is to get um, the high school world language credit for the knowledge of the Russian language, um, which is great opportunity for them uh, to um, deepen their language, to learn some academic language if we're talking about uh, heritage spe speakers too. Um, so like I'm saying, this the technology, uh, too much technology during the class is wrong, but, um, you know, if you don't have uh, somebody who can check you during the week, like I see in my online classes, I see students once a week. That's not really enough. So I assign work uh, for them to do at home, like in a little portion, like I'm telling them at least, you know, 15, 20 minutes a day, you can complete this exercise. So um, I, it, it really works for me. They can record, they can record videos of themselves talking. Um, so I can use formative for instruction, for homework, or for the assessment too. So there is a different mode. You can put assessment, um, and then uh, there will be in a time when they cannot use any other outside tools. So on the computer, only formative, and they cannot access the Google Translate or something like that for the assessment, for the summative assessment. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention about the uh, phonetics, yes, sometimes it's very hard. And it's hard that I work with students who have different proficiency levels uh, at the same time. Uh, so some things that have to be done, maybe even independently. Um, I use, there is a free program. Uh, the free program is a learning, a learning app, uh, learning apps that work, right? So this is a free program, uh, doesn't have any accountability per like points, or you cannot set up a classroom there, but you can set up some uh, exercise for phonetics uh, with a self-check that students actually can work on it. Um, and it could be like a targeted um, intervention with each you know students um, and some grammar too. So if I have um, you know, a class, I'm not necessarily have a time for the little like a spot check uh, during the class, but I'm assigning some independent work that they can uh, do at home. It's phonics or some grammar exercise with the cases to, um, you know, something that if all class needs it, I'll spend some time talking about this. But if, you know, half of the class or maybe three fourths of the class, they, they know all the cases and they know uh, the endings. I'm not going to spend like a grammar lesson just for two students who have, you know, problems with this, but I will assign them some uh, technology to work on this endings and then um, report back to me. Thank you. Thank you for that, Larissa. And yes, that is definitely, it's actually a good segue into my next question.